I think today's lecture is almost what, to me, this is the benefit of trying to do stress transformation and principal stresses using linear algebra because in 2D, you probably did this in mechanics and materials with more circle or a free body diagram where you're rotating that plane and you're trying to calculate the angles as you rotate the plane. My, uh, kind of my belief is that there's no need for all of that nonsense. If you just do a little bit of linear algebra, which you've already learned, sure it's rusty and haven't used it in a while, but like if you're, you've used some of this stuff, dotting matrices into matrices, dotting vectors into vectors, um, rotating stuff, eigenvalues, eigenvectors. The benefit is that this, the stress transformation that you learn in 2D, either using more circle or free body diagrams, is really hard to extend to 3D. And you might have done something in mechanics and materials where you looked at like, like pseudo 3D stress transformation. If you ever saw a more circle that has like three circles and like there's like a little circle and a big circle and like a huge circle. If not, if this doesn't make any sense, it's fine. It's, I, it's kind of like a hack way of doing, doing 3D. Um, but I think the, the, the real benefit of, of doing this kind of with an eye towards the tools that we already know is that nothing changes when you move to 3D. The, the governing equations are still the same. So we're talking about stress. And the important equations you need to know about stress is, well, one is you got to figure out if your structure is in equilibrium. So equilibrium, we say that the divergence of our stress tensor plus some body forces has to equal zero. Fine, you know that by now, you know that this is not a particularly friendly term. You have to unpack it. It's a, um, it, it's a partial differential equation. And because we're in 3D, the equilibrium equations are actually three partial differential equations that you have to satisfy. One for uh, each of the body force directions, the so kind of Fx, Fy, Fz. Oftentimes you'll see this written without the F and you'll say in the absence of body forces, your stress needs to be divergence free. Um, the reason why I point that out is because most physical laws are some object is divergence free for equilibrium. If you like look back to your like electricity and magnetism texts, you're gonna see like a divergence free, uh, whatever it's gonna be, the electromagnetic tensor. The same thing is gonna be true in, uh, uh, in fluids, in there's a, a variety of, of mechanics and um, thermodynamics problems which equilibrium relies on some object being divergence free. Now, the, in most areas of physics, that object that's divergence free is a vector. So it's not too bad. Solid mechanics are a little bit harder because the thing that's divergence free for us is a tensor. And so it means you end up with all these extra equations and it's a little bit, a little bit messier. But the object is that this thing, this physical thing, stress tensor needs to be divergence free. We know, I think now, because you've seen this in 305 and again here, we know that um, stress, the stress tensor represents the physical kind of attributes of an object in stress that is under loading. It's a physical property. It's a real physical thing that describes the state of stress of a, of a material. Just because it's a three by three matrix, it can it kind of be, uh, confusing or, or intimidating, but it's just an object that describes the state of stress, uh, a mathematical object that describes the state of stress of a, of a real uh, point in space. And just like all the laws of physics, that mathematical object should not depend on the way you measure it. And so we need to think about how do we transform our stress measured from one state to stress measured to another state. And we did that last class using tools from linear algebra where we said, well, if I want my new stress tensor, it's just gonna be equal to my rotation matrix dotted into my old stress tensor 
dotted into the transpose of my rotation matrix. And the third thing we knew is that is that we have this messy object, this three by three tensor that describes the state of stress of a, of a point in space. And we know that that tensor will have different components. The components are the numbers inside the matrix, inside the tensor. We know that that, that stress tensor will have different components depending on the coordinate system you use to measure it, depending on where you choose your x, y, and z, or your r, theta, uh, phi, or whatever coordinate system you're in. And so because it's a matrix, and we know that that matrix has particular properties, certain quantities that are kind of uh, special or, or um, are kind of invariant, they don't depend on the way you measure them at all. And that's why they're incredibly powerful is they're invariant to the way you measure this, the stress of this object. And also, they tell you what the largest component of stress is, which is a way for you as an engineer to say whether or not your object is going to break based on comparing that largest stress value to um, the ultimate or failure strength or plasticity yield strength uh, of your material. And this can be written a bunch of different ways. If I use vertical lines to signal a determinant, then it will look like this. That doesn't look like an I, but it's an I. Those vertical lines are here, I'm using it to imply that we're taking the determinant of the stuff inside there. What's nice is that this is what you need to be able to describe the states of, of, of stress within, a, uh, within an object. In 2D, we showed that this isn't too bad at all. Um, Q and 2D. I forget which one's which. I think it's sign top right. Yeah. And you know how to think the transpose you're just reflecting around the diagonal. You know how to think the determinant of a 2D matrix as well. The determinant of a 2D matrix is pretty straightforward. It's you multiply the diagonal terms together, subtract off the off diagonal terms multiplied by each other. So the nice thing is, is the stress transformation and principal stress equations don't change when we move from 2D to 3D. What does change is Q, the rotation matrix. And the other thing that changes is you probably know off the top of your head how to do the determinant of a two by two matrix, but you probably remember some awful like IJK three column thing that you had to figure out how to do the determinant of a three by three matrix. And so the equation doesn't change, but the actual calculation tool is more of a pain in 3D. But that's okay too, because we are, we are transcendent mathematicians. We're using the tools at our hands to, to solve these problems. And Mathematica handles that very cleanly for us. And if you want to do it by hand, you can just go back to your linear algebra notes and remember how to do determinants in higher dimensions. Okay, so the, the really doing stress transformation in 3D just requires us to sort out what the rotation matrix is in 3D. And And with all due respect to Ugaral and our textbook, I feel like this is one space where our textbook falls flat. So I would highly recommend, this is probably the, uh, the easiest recommendation any of you will ever follow. Don't read this section of the textbook on stress transformation in 3D. 
uh, I feel like it it makes a mess of something that is pretty straightforward if we do it with using some tools from linear algebra. And that's what we're going to do today. So the textbook I feel like will might confuse you here. If you don't believe me, dive in, um, have fun. But I think there's a there's a more straightforward way to do this. And that's what we're going to do today. So our goal is to calculate. Oops. Our goal is to calculate Q, the rotation matrix in 3D. And you can probably guess why this is tricky. And it's tricky because in 2D, there's only one angle. You're just rotating like around a plane, around some fixed axis. In 3D, you have three angles. You could grab onto each of your X, Y, and Z axes and spin, and then you'll have an angle for each of those. And so that's where the problem comes in, is, is how do we construct uh, the rotation matrix when you're trying to rotate an object uh, in 3D? And so what we will do is let me draw what this is going to look like. Our steps to calculate Q is that what we want to do is we want to figure out what the rotation matrix looks like. If we imagine a X, Y, and Z. What we're going to do is we're going to take we have three independent coordinates we're going to take each one separately grab it and spin around it so imagine kind of grabbing the x-axis and spinning it so that we're rotating x and y oh, sorry uh, imagine grabbing the z-axis and spinning it so that we're rotating x and y we're going to get a, a transformation matrix for that. Then we're going to grab the x axis, spin it so that we rotate y and z. And then we're going to grab the y axis and spin it so that we rotate x and z. Then we're going to get a, a rotation matrix for each of those three conditions. So, for instance, I can take my z axis and spin it this way. And as I do that, I'm going to get a new coordinate. Actually, I could probably draw that as a line, can't I? The color here, let's see. Purple. Oop. We have X prime. Supposed to be orthogonal. There we go. Y prime. This corresponds to an angle. This is almost exactly the same thing we've already done. We're going to, to rename this angle so that our angles in 3D are going to be alpha, beta, gamma. So we're going to call this angle alpha, which is if you hold Z fixed and you just spin the X and Y frames, you're going to rotate by an angle alpha. Now there's some stuff that you possibly have forgotten. I find that this concept actually, if you're considering further education, either electives in finite element methods or uh, continuum mechanics or elasticity or any uh, or any graduate path, um, some of this stuff that you learn probably in linear algebra is really important to it will be really useful going forward. And one of those things is understanding uh, the, uh, the basis vectors that you might recall from, from uh, uh, like a, a linear algebra course, which are essentially kind of the, these vectors here. Let's see if I can draw this. 
you know, you, you're thinking again, it's either I hat or you'll often see these written. I think I'm uh, as like E hat X, E hat Y, and E hat Z. And remembering how these things interact when you dot them into each other or cross them into each other, this type of stuff comes up over and over again in, um, uh, in continuum mechanics and, and solid mechanics and such. Part of the reason why it does is because eventually you get interested in things that are not like small deflection things. So once you get away from small deflections, there's a lot that we're kind of sweeping under the rug and not really thinking about. And a lot of these transformation ideas come back into play. So let me give you an example. If you're, if you're doing things in small in a small deflection regime, then you can calculate your stress relative to your original coordinate system. And everything's fine because every, if everything's small, Taylor series says that that if everything's small, everything's in this tiny angle, then the original coordinate system is basically the same as the new coordinate system. So we can just calculate our stresses relative to the new coordinate system. In large deformations, growth, biomechanics problems where you're loading a tissue by actually stretching it. Um, in problems that are involving soft materials like soft robotics or, or stuff where you're getting these large actuations and deformations. You can't really use your original reference frame anymore. And so the question becomes, well, what, where do you calculate stress? Do you calculate stress in your new coordinate system or your old coordinate system? And it turns out you can do one or the other. If you run a finite element simulation, it's going to spit out stresses that it can color code on there. And it's going to give you different names for those stresses that are complicated sounding, like the first piola Kirchhoff stress and the Cauchy stress or the second piola Kirchhoff stress. And it's not within the kind of uh, important ideas of this course to go through each of those for you. But what I want to tell you is that what they are are just different ways of, of measuring stress. Are you measuring stress in your new coordinate system or your old one? And that's re and, and, and what you'll find is that you'll get different answers depending on which one you choose. And, and, and for whatever problem you're interested in, um, you'll kind of want to know, all right, well, how do I switch from the second pure of Kirchhoff stress to the first pure of Kirchhoff stress? All of these things are related to what we're talking about here. It's just transforming coordinate systems transforming the, the tensors that you're measuring in one system to the tensors you're measuring in another. So these ideas of, I have a coordinate system, it has basis vectors, I know how to take my basis vectors and dot them into each other and I know what will happen, can be really extendable, especially into um, uh, like a lot of the kind of the places where solid mechanics is finding utility now, which is in biomechanics, um, soft robotic stuff, um, large deployable structures, stuff like stuff like that in aerospace um, applications. And so what I'm saying right now will seem kind of like, I don't know, just like more math details, but like these concepts are pervasive in, in solid mechanics. So our rotation matrix, so what we're after now, is a, we want a, let's, let me move this thing over here. We want for this configuration to calculate a rotation matrix, we'll call it L sub Z, which is a function of alpha. I'm gonna calculate three L's. L sub X, L sub Y, L sub Z. Each one will be a function of a different angle. And then with those three things, we can calculate our Q. And then, and then that's, a, that's our goal.
So how do you calculate these things? I'm only going to do this one once because it's pretty repetitive. And once you see the pattern, it's it's not too bad. But the entries of this matrix are it's a two by two, sorry, it's a three by three matrix. It's going to have three rows, three columns. And the way you calculate it is you take the basis vectors and you dot them into each other appropriately. What I mean by that is this top one should be XX. So you take EX and you dot it into EX. EY dotted into EY. E hat Z dot into E hat Z. This one, E hat X dotted into E hat Y, and E hat X dotted into E hat Z. And this one's going to be E hat Y dotted into E hat Z. And I'm being lazy here because this one is this one. This one is this one. And this one is this one by symmetry. Actually, I'm totally confusing you here. I apologize. Let me, I'm going to change for one very tiny thing to what I just wrote in there, but it's actually a pretty crucial, a pretty important thing. What we're actually doing is not dotting them into each other. We're dotting the old one into the new one. And so our new coordinate system also has a basis vector. E hat X prime, E hat Y prime, and E hat Z prime. And so actually, apologies, thanks for being patient with me. Actually, what you're doing is you're dotting E hat X into E hat X prime, E hat Y into E hat Y prime. So add a little prime to all of the second entries there. Sorry about that. That makes more sense. Otherwise, we would have gotten a lot of useless stuff out of this matrix. Let's do the easiest one first. What's E hat Z dotted into E hat Z prime? You have probably two reasonable guesses. In case you can't remember your. He had Z and he had Z prime lie on top of each other. If you dot two vectors into each other, you get one. You might have been thinking zero. That's when they're orthogonal to each other. This one's pretty easy because this one's basically the rotation matrix we found in 2D because this is the same problem we did in 2D, right? It's the problem in 2D. It looks exactly like this. We just didn't draw the z-axis. And so we know what the rotation matrix Q is in 2D. But just to remind you, if you dot this thing into this thing, you're doing the, the dot product of these two basis vectors, and you're taking the cosine of the angle between them. Right, so the cosine of the angle between x and x prime, we don't know what it is, but we know it's going to be cosine alpha. And 
if I'm dotting y into y prime, this angle is also alpha. That doesn't look like alpha. This angle is also alpha, right? So square being rotated. And so on the diagonal, this thing is also cosine alpha. The other one might be a little bit trickier to see, but I am asking you to dot. Uh, let's do this one. E hat X into E hat Y prime or E hat Y into E hat X prime. And so you end up with shifting things by pi over two, right? Because you end up with like, I have, oh gosh, no. You end up with like, this is pi over two. And so if I'm doing something with this and this, then I have kind of pi over two plus alpha. Or if I do something that's like this and this, then I have pi over two minus alpha. And so what happens when you add pi over two to the cosine of an angle, you end up switching to a sine. And so depending on if you're adding, Cosine pi over two plus alpha or minus alpha, you end up with positive sign and negative sign. And so then you end up getting the Q, the matrix that you thought you we had before, which was sine alpha, negative sign alpha. Oh, I'm wrong here, aren't I? These aren't symmetric. No, no, no. Apologies, everyone. I'm making a mess of things today. Okay, let me just get this. Let me get this right here. That's yeah. Ah, right. Because this, of course, is going to be e hat y dot e hat x prime. Yeah. All right. Sorry, everyone. Make a mess of things. This one. These rotation matrices are not symmetric. But you can kind of see the pattern here. So this has uh, x, y, z, and this has x prime, x prime, x prime. Um, oops, we don't want to. y prime. Oh, that's terrible. Y prime, Y prime, Y prime, Z prime, Z prime, Z prime. So you can kind of see the pattern there. And the remainder of this rotation matrix fills out with a bunch of zeros when you're dotting them into Z prime. Why? Because they remain orthogonal to Z prime. Z prime hasn't changed, so you're dotting them two things that are orthogonal to each other, so you get something that's zero. This should be familiar because this is just the Q that you we used last time. I'm going to call it Q2D. That's the Q we were using last time. Okay, I promise you this wouldn't be too painful, but you're probably like, this is actually kind of painful. Um, but here's all we have to do. Q is in 3D is just gonna be equal to LX dotted into LY dotted into LZ. And so all we need to do is calculate each of these three matrices independent of each other, and then dot them into each other and we get our Q. And because this statement is still true, 
then our, our problem actually is pretty straightforward. I'm just going to draw out. We're not going to go through all the, the, the dotting for each of these things. I'm just going to show you what we're actually doing as we switch. So let's do LX. We do LX, then Our y prime becomes this, we'll call it beta. This is also beta. This is to z prime. We're just spinning around the x axis. The end result is Lx is a function of beta. You get the exact same matrix, it's just that we flop the positions of things a little bit. What do we switch? Well, now x dotted into x prime is one. So the top left hand coordinate thing is one component. All your x primes and x's are zero. And the result is cosine beta, cosine beta sine beta, negative sine beta. Basically the same matrix. This is still my Q2D, just sitting in a little different spot. And lastly, we can get our we'll rotate around Y, spin here, let's pick a new color. Our new angle is going to be gamma. Ly is just a function of gamma. Y dotted into itself. Y dotted into y prime is going to be one. So the one goes in the middle here. All the y terms are zero. Those are all the here, 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 and here. And then the rest looks sort of similar. It's just that your sine term ends up in a new location. Cos gamma, cos gamma. Let me just double check that, and make sure that I have my signs. Right, I think I do. Yeah. And the nice thing is that, I mean, this is it. All we did is we just grabbed one of the, we treated it as three separate 2D problems. We grabbed one of the axes, rotated, did some linear algebra. We dotted basis vectors into each other. That allowed us to calculate the rotation of each angle individually. And then this relationship up here tells us how do we actually calculate so if you have the Mathematica notebook I sent you last uh, last class, um, then you can load that up and you can follow along.
I'll give you a second to load up. It's much nicer to do this in Mathematica than dotting those three matrices in by hand. So we're just going to input them and see what it can spit out for us. I just created a generic stress tensor, um, which just looks like what you would expect it to look like. Sigma X equal Y Z. I kind of wish I had turned this into X. Let me just switch this to XX. No, I won't because you all have the same one. Okay. Um, you don't can run this one or you not, it doesn't really matter. I was just using it. Um, we might use it later. But here's what we were just doing. I'm going to make these look a little bit more familiar. Well, I guess it doesn't look that, that familiar. Sort of, right? That's like one, zero, zero. This is LX with beta. Remember what this notation means. It says to find a function LX. Lx is a function of beta. Look for beta on the other side of the equation. That's what this underscore is for. And then there's a little delay set equals. So it's not just equals, it's like colon equals, which means just store this, don't run it until I tell you to. Um, so this is your Lx of beta. Ly of gamma is the one we just got. Cos zero is negative sign. 0, 1, 0, sine 0, cos. And LZ is the first one we did. This looks just like the standard rotation matrix. And just to, I said this last class, but I want to reiterate in case anyone missed it. The rotation matrices are slightly different depending on whether you rotate the reference frame or you rotate the object. In Mechanics and materials, solid mechanics, structural mechanics, we always rotate the reference frame. So it'll we always use kind of Q instead of R if you're like if you're remembering your linear algebra. So these are the three matrices, not too bad. And then Q is found by just taking each of them and dotting them into each other. LZ of alpha, LY, LX. The period in Mathematica is the dot. And now Q takes three things. Q takes the three angles that you might rotate. Are you gonna, you're going to rotate alpha, beta, gamma. So you have to tell it your uh, Q, which is a function of all those things, what the angle of rotation is, and you go from there. Let's look at Q and show you why we're doing this on a computer instead of by hand. Oops. Better. Yeah, this is why. This is just like guaranteed typo getting made. But we don't care. We don't need to memorize this. We don't need to know anything about this. We just need to know that the rotation matrix is just the dot product of kind of rotating each of the frames separately. Rotating around X, rotating around Y, rotating around Z, and you get the rotation matrix. The fact that this thing is a mess, we don't care. Because all we need to know is that Q dot our stress tensor dot Q transpose gives us uh, our newly rotated stress state. This is the benefit of um, doing this thing uh, with the help of Mathematica, especially in this next line here, because this next line is the same thing we wrote last class. It says, I'm going to write a function. It's going to be called my stress rotated. I'll call it sigma r. And to calculate my rotated stress, I need four things. I need my original stress tensor, and then I need the three angles that I'm going to rotate it. And that's it. It's Q 
dot it into stress, dot it into Q transpose. We can expand this and look like at what the first term looks like. It looks kind of horrendous. I don't, uh, I don't know why I'm even showing you it, um, but it's just a mess. And so, but it's as you can see, it's a mess, but it's also just a whole bunch of sines and cosines of the angles, right? It's like the stress components times some combination of sines or cosines of the various angles that you're rotating. Instead of looking at this in this kind of horrendous uh, generic notation, let's just play with a simple problem. I don't know why I did this twice. All right, take this, this you can just ignore. These are the same exact things. Delete this. Okay, so see if you can take this stress state and rotate it by 45 degrees counterclockwise around the Z axis. If you don't have Mathematica, you can also just kind of sketch out what you would do with the functions if you could input them, like what would you send to sigma r. You're also welcome to just shout out any mathematica related questions they might have if you're stuck or not, something's not working. Obviously, if you have this notebook, it's kind of in here for you. So I just kind of want you to get a second to play with it. But if pi o, if 90 degrees is pi over 2, then 45 degrees is pi over 4. And so we're, we're rotating is our Q or rotation matrix is just going to be pi over 4. Alpha is going to be the angle, right? Because we rotated around the z-axis. And so it's just going to spin around alpha. The rest is 0. And so you just get some trig uh, results here. And then your rotated st stress state takes in your original stress state and then the angles, and you get something like this. You can see in this new stress state, as you would expect, as you rotate, what you're finding is that Sigma X is de sigma X X is decreasing a little bit. Sigma Y Y is increasing. Sigma Z Z should be staying the same because the orientation of the Z axis didn't change, and that's what happens. It started out as thirty, ended up as as thirty. I think this is kind of anticlimactic, but like it works. It's just the same stuff. It's just Q dot stress dot Q transpose. The challenge was us finding Q. But we split up Q into three simple problems. Grab one axis, rotate it, calculate the rotation matrix for that um, uh, for that axis, do it three times, and then dot them into each other. And this is stress transformation in 3D. It's it's the same. It's Q dot stress dot Q transpose. And you just have to keep track of three angles now. 
and we had to calculate Q in a more complex way. But I don't know, it's not too bad, I hope. Questions about this? All right, I'm going to switch back to my iPad for a second. The other thing we're doing is also not that bad. It's the same exact thing we did last time. It's just that calculating it in 3D is, is a bit of a pain. And so we're going to use Mathematica again, but I also want to remind you what we're doing before we do that. So we sorted out stress transformation in 3D. The last thing we need to do is sort out the principal stresses in 3D. And it's the same problem. It's the same problem. It's the same equation. It's just take your stress tensor, subtract off some unknown that it multiplies the identity matrix. Take the determinant of that object and set it equal to zero. The reason you often do this in 2D is because the determinant's easier to do in 2D. And it's because the result of doing this in 2D is you end up with what's called the characteristic equation, which had lambda squared times some invariant, uh, plus or minus lambda times some other invariant, plus or minus lambda, uh, uh, plus or minus the uh, third invariant. Lambda squared. Oh, it's just brain dump all day today. Um, there it is. It's lambda squared times nothing minus the first invariant times lambda plus the second invariant equals zero. The reason I bring that up is because the determinant in 2D is easy to do, but the result is a characteristic equation that's a second order polynomial which means you can solve it with the quadratic equation. 3D is hard for two reasons. One, calculating the determinant by hand is a pain, as you've done before and remember. But two, you end up with a cubic polynomial equation, lambda cubed uh, minus uh, invariant one times lambda squared plus invariant two times lambda minus uh, invariant three equals zero. The cubic equation is solvable by hand. Um, it's a huge pain, which is why you never learned it in like high school when you learned the quadratic equation. Um, but it is solvable. And so the end result of this, of this after some algebra is what I was just saying. It's going to be an equation that looks like lambda cubed minus some invariant times lambda squared plus a second invariant times lambda minus I3. The nice thing is that these two things, these two invariants, are the same invariants as, as they are in 2D. The first invariant 
of a 3D matrix is just the trace of the matrix. So add up the stuff on the diagonals. That's it. The second invariant, I'm sorry, the third invariant is also the same as the invariant we found in 2D. It's take the determinant of your stress tensor. Now, again, it's a 3D stress tensor, so that determinant is a little bit messy, so I'm not going to write it all out, but you know how to calculate the determinant. And if you don't, Mathematica does for you. The second invariant is something new. And it's not quite as clean to write down, but it looks like this. One half times the trace of your stress tensor squared plus, oh, sorry, minus the trace of the square of your stress tensor. So the first term says calculate the trace and then square it. Second term says square all the components of your tensor and then calculate the trace. And then you just gotta take the difference between the two of them. These invariants have like physical, um, so, sort of physical interpretations to them. Like the trace is, is essentially uh, kind of separating out how much of, of, the, of the deformation goes to like, um, uh, imagine it's a cube. The trace is essentially telling you how much of the deformation is taking this cube that you have and just making it a bigger cube or a smaller cube. The determinant is saying how much of this deformation is taking that cube you have and distorting it into a parallel pipette. And the, the other one uh, is a mess and I don't have a good, like kind of nice analogy for what it's doing, but like they are invariants. So they're important mathematically, but they're, they're also kind of giving you information about, um, there's the terms in your textbook you would use for this would be like the spherical components of your, of your stress tensor, which is kind of saying like how much of this is equally becoming a, a sphere and then the second term is like the I think it's distortional components like how much of the deformation is going to distorting it which is kind of important like if you have a complex loading problem your question is kind of like what's it doing you know like what's it doing to my structure is it is it just trying to stretch it in all directions is it sort of like a hydrostatic pressure or is it really trying to distort this object in which I have to worry about um, shear for formation, shear bending, all sorts of other artifacts that come when you're kind of placing an object in really like a distortional uh, framework. So we're not going to uh, set this up and solve it by hand here um, because there's really no benefit to doing that. But we will, again, do this in Mathematica. So I'll show you what this looks like so you don't have to uh, handle it. So let me switch again. We're going to plow through what we usually do for a break today because um, today's lecture is going to be uh, shorter than normal. Okay, so we just did the stress rotation. I'll close that up. If you scroll down a little bit further, then we get to our principal stresses. And so here's the determinant of our stress tensor minus the lambda times my identity matrix. And in mathematics, you have to tell it what order is your identity matrix, second order, third order, so on and so forth. And it looks kind of awful, but you can see here, like, look, that's definitely the trace, the sum of the diagonals, not too bad. Um, this one, no, nah, I don't want to guess. One of these is definitely the determinant, but, um, 
I three, so it's gonna be the one multiplying nothing. So it's gonna be this one. Yeah, that one's your determinant, and then the other one's the uh, weird combo. I don't know why I defined it in this way. This is I should have probably defined it the way I told you in, in your in your notes, but I just defined the invariant separately, so that way we can write the characteristic equation as such. But look, invariant one, trace, invariant three. Determinant and variant two is some weird combination of uh, of the components of the stress tensor. You could define it the way I wrote it in your notes, and it'd be a lot more sensical. Again, the purpose of all of this is that with the help of something like Mathematica, calculating eigenvalues and eigenvectors is trivial. It's just asking it for the eigenvalues of the matrix. So, like literally saying, give me the eigenvalues of my thing. Um, and I do it this way because of the note that I put in there, which is to say that this is kind of a disaster. Like if we're not going to write down, like in 2D, we can write down, oh, the principal stress is like this quantity as plus this, because the result of the 2D eigenvalues is, uh, one of the two solutions of the quadratic equation. And the second one is the other solution of the quadratic equation. Here you are dealing with solutions to the cubic equation. The solutions to the cubic equation are nightmares. So if you want to see that, you can just say sigma, sigma p of sigma. You can tell, what I mean by it's a nightmare is like, it's actually trying to numerically find a root here. So it's like asking for roots of these equations, which basically means you have curves and it's saying find the intersections of all of these. I'm only showing you this as to tell you why we're not going through this by hand, but the result is it does give you the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, eigenvectors is the is are there's the directions associated with those those vector uh, those values, but it's the same eigenvectors eigenvalues, and we can just look at one quick example. So let's take a stress tensor. I picked some arbitrary one with a bunch of random components in there, and you might be curious to know: Is this thing going to fail under compression? Maybe this is a concrete pile. And maybe it can withstand a certain amount of, of compressive load. Uh, and if it exceeds some threshold, is it going to break? And you can't answer whether it's going to break here. But you can just take this stress tensor that we found and then ask Mathematica for the eigenvalues of it. So we can just say, like, give me the eigenvalues of sigma e1. It just spits out the diagonal components. So that's sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3. I'll do that on my computer here. Sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3. We define this as a function, doesn't really matter. We can spit out the eigenvectors as well, telling us which direction do you need to rotate your frame so that way you get these uh, uh, principal stresses acting normal to that. Does everyone get this? Like these principal stresses are saying at some point in your, at, at this point in your material, if you rotated the frame a certain way, you would find the largest magnitude of your stresses. And the largest magnitude of your stresses are gonna, they're gonna be normal stresses. And therefore, there's going to be a, an orientation of your ref of your coordinate system that's normal to that that stress direction. And the question is, what orientation? And the eigenvectors tell you what orientation corresponds to the particular eigenvalues. They kind of go hand in hand. Eigenvalue is the magnitude of the vector. Eigenvector is the orientation of the of the vector. The reason you want to know that is because you would want to be able, this is the type of information you can use to determine either how to reinforce something, like where do you need more material, where your weakest spots are, um, 
or you know where crack propagation or crack formation might start and where you need to um, help blunt blunt cracks um, and so the eigenvalues and eigenvectors kind of map together essentially they kind of tell you how to rotate your frame such that you uh, you can identify the direction in which your stresses are the largest I want to just go back over here and remind you what I said at the beginning, which is that your object is equilibrium is in equilibrium if your stress is divergence free. And then you can rep, you can transform between any stress configuration, any coordinate system you want to use to measure things by just rotating your stress state. And this is the generic formula. If you don't, you don't ever have to do in 2D again, because you have a way of doing it in 3D. And you can just say, well, just rotate alpha, and that's the 2D stress transformation matrix. It's all the same, and it's just linear algebra, it's just taking rotation matrices dotting them into your original tensor, dotting them into the transpose of your rotation features. This is the stuff you've learned before. We're just applying it to structural mechanics problems to figure out where in the structure stresses might be largest. We calculate our principal stresses and to figure out how do we evaluate uh, our structure if we were to either be comparing multiple different reference frames or trying to think about what happens as we go from small deflection theory to larger deflection theory where we need to kind of switch back and forth between our deformed state and our reference state. The takeaway is just that with tools of linear algebra applied to structural mechanics, we have kind of just a couple of simple equations that we have to remember. And you don't really even need to remember all the stuff that went into Q. All you need to know is that what did we do to find the rotation matrix? We just took it, our 3D frame, grabbed an axis and rotated it, and then just dotted the basis vectors into each other. And then we did that three times. Once you have that, you can calculate your rotation matrix in 3D. It's a mess, but it's pretty straightforward to, to use. And that's what I was trying to show with those mathematical notebooks. Um, questions? Next class we will, which I think, which I guess is next Tuesday, we will um, start on looking at how, you know, we're, we're basically showing, hey, stress is actually something that varies throughout the body. It's a differential equation that uses to, to describe it. Strain is as well. Strain, as we've seen up until this point, we've, we've seen this in a couple of examples that strain varies through the body. And so then we need to think of it in terms of a set of differential equations. And so we will define strain in 1D and then in 2D and then see how that gives us the strain tensor uh, in 3D. And once we have stress and strain and some basic understanding of constitutive models, we can do a couple uh, simple problems that we can uh, solve and, 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 and just get some structural deformations of, of, uh, of a couple different classes of problems. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of setup here. There's a lot of like, we have to lay a large foundation for us to, uh, to work on these things. But we're kind of done with stress and we're going to move on just to strain. So. If there's no questions, uh, I apologize for missing uh, office hours this afternoon. If you have any, if you want to meet with me, just send me an email. I'll try to find the time that we can chat. And otherwise, enjoy the wellness day. I will try to do the same, and we'll chat again next week. Take care, everyone.